the bunker busters are going to have a very low rate of success. No question about it. This is a simulation of what's claimed to be the Bunker Buster Braun, the GBU-57, which is alleged to be able to go up to 200 feet into the, into the ground, even through uh, reinforced concrete, before it will then explode. What you're seeing is a simulation of what's claimed is that because of the, the uh, surface of the missile itself, uh, it will be able to burrow deep down inside there and then get into, like it's you know showing here, uh, some kind of underground facility, and then will explode. That's the claim. Now tell us the reality. Well, um, if uh, why don't we go to my slides for the moment and let's go to sli start with slide 16, 1, 6, Gary. This is a photograph of one of these bunker busters. They weigh about 30,000 pounds. Most of their weight is uh, steel. Uh, you know, is uh, in fact, I think it's about uh, uh, five or 6,000 pounds of explosives in this 30,000 pound munition. And you need a lot of steel because you want it to have a lot of weight. And you also need to protect the explosives inside it so that they don't get pre-detonated, uh, you know, uh, before the munition penetrates deep enough into the ground. If we go uh, to, uh, to slide 18, we'll see a diagram of how this munition is allegedly supposed to work. I say allegedly. Uh, this is another example of contractors um, uh, making claims uh, that, uh, or, or people who are working for contractors or people who do not understand the details, who are advising higher level political decision makers. This is a real problem I've talked about in the past. You have people who don't know what they're talking about, bringing the information up to people who are political decision makers, who may or may not care about the details, and the result is you get a big disconnect in what they think they're capable of doing relative to what is actually the case. And it may be that uh, Trump, th that 3 p.m., we're going to see some of these munitions dropped on Iran. I don't know if that's true. I'm just guessing. It's a wild guess. Yeah, that's kind of the implication from, from what I was told. This might be our entry into this war. That's what really worries me. Well, and, that, and you uh, know, it's, it's funny, really to your worse. point here, that you, you have, we have seen Trump uh, in the last 24 hours uh, dismiss the concerns that what Iran might do to us because he says, no, we're, we're protected, which implies to me just what you just said, that someone's telling him, oh, yeah, we got all kinds of good air defense. And by the way, these bunker busters definitely can go 200 feet. But I, one other thing from this diagram you're talking about here, this also implies that Iran uh, built these bunkers that they didn't do any creativity, i.e. it's just straight down, so it's a nice little shaft that you can drop it into, as opposed to being offset or maybe multiple angles before where it is. We don't even know for sure under the ground where this thing may end up being. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you're kind of shooting blind anyway. You've preempted me, and that's good. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you and No, you and Gary do it all the time. It's great. Uh, uh, in this diagram, what you see is a depiction of a, of a penetrating warhead that goes uh, 200 feet into the ground, around 60 meters, and, uh, and then detonates at its maximum depth. Now, uh, the detonation of the 6,000 pounds of explosives uh, can create a cavity of pro probably around 10 or 15 meters in radius, uh, so maybe 20 or 30 meters in diameter. Uh, now, uh, if there's a tunnel below it that's another 20 meters below it, it could probably punch through the top of the tunnel too. But the tunnel's got to be within uh, 10 or 20 meters of the location of, of the explosion. In other words, what if the tunnel is offset by 30 meters? We don't know where that tunnel is. We have no idea where the tunnel is. And... Uh, so uh, unless there's a big cave under there where it might penetrate to or, or the tunnel or the big cave is very shallow, uh, then uh, you might actually have a situation where uh, you, 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 know, you could do quite a bit of damage. But uh, you know, 
there's not necessarily any reason to believe that the Iranians would design something this way. So yep. um, uh, now, just to um, uh, uh, in the case of the Fordo uh, nuclear facility, uh, let's just take a quick look at slide 19. I know Gary loves this stuff too. He does. <laughs> I do too. He does. <laughs> um, the um, notice that uh, there, th this is the structures that are underground are under um, hills. You know, in other words, the surface of the ground is not flat and perfectly perpendicular to something that's coming on a perpendicular trajectory. That's good. That's relevant. And we'll see that uh, in, starting with the next slide. So um, now this is a, uh, I chose this article in particular. There are a lot of articles like this, incidentally, because there are a lot of people all over the world who study these things. And uh, I chose this article in particular because there are five authors of the article. They're all Chinese. You know, this uh, business of the Chinese somehow, you know, stealing all our technology. And, you know, uh, Lindsey Graham and some of these other people better begin to understand that we're dealing with a highly sophisticated country, Iran among them. And there are highly sophisticated, very well-trained engineers and scientists in these countries. And the countries uh, are utilizing these people for their defense. So this uh, particular um, um, uh, uh, article here is, is about uh, deflections that are caused on projectiles that penetrate into what they call composite concrete targets. But uh, let me just, if you go to uh, slide 22, we'll see this is uh, an example of what they call a composite target. Uh, in, in, in this particular case, this, the diamond-shaped object that you see with a 120-degree angle that's labeled is, uh, is a long piece of concrete. It's an elongated piece of concrete with a diamond uh, cross-section. And uh, if, you, if we go to slide 23, the next slide, there you see. You see uh, in the middle of this uh, target that's set up for their test, you see this slab in front of you in the middle of it, and that's got a diamond shape. Now, if you go back to slide 22, the effect of the diamond shape is to cause the, uh, the, um, uh, the penetrating munition to be deflected. Let's mm. go back one more slide to 21. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. That's, that's ver the implications are considerable. Oh, you bet. You bet. So if you're, if you're attacking a concrete uh, uh, under a bunker, you really want to have your munition hit the surface perpendicular. In this case shown you here, the, um, the munition hits this... Um, diamond shape and, and of course the surface is at an angle of 60 degrees in this case relative to the vertical if you look at the front where it's labeled a what happens is the motion of the front is slowed up by the engagement with the surface as it begins to penetrate well the the the, the front is slowed up but the back is not slowed up. Where well, you see the uh, mm. W, the omega sign. Oh, yeah. What happens is the munition will twist uh, toward uh, the surface. It'll 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 develop a direction, a deflection. And what we're seeing in the next slide, 22, is just an illustration of a like a 25 degree deflection. Now, you. Uh, when you build uh, a, uh, a concrete uh, protection, protective surface, uh, you, you intentionally put in these inhomogeneous uh, sections. Uh, tanks have inhomogeneous armor. It's a different concept. The, the armor 
but you know, space armor and things of that type. And uh, it's the same concept. You know, you have a munition that's very long and very uh, fast coming, and it hits the tank, and and some part of the uh, of the tank uh, um, uh, protective uh, structure is harder or more dense than the next uh, the other piece, and it causes the munition to twist, and then you have a space between that piece of armor and and the next piece, and and you can divert the, the munition and keep the tank from uh, the tank crew from being killed or hurt. So uh, this is a, a concept that is very well understood, and uh, you know studied in great detail. Now, um, who's to say what's under the ground <laughs> at these shelters? I don't know. And uh, you know, uh, the United States may have people who know something about what's under the ground because, you know, our intelligence looks at how you you know when you when you look at intelligence uh, photos, you you can often see the structure, you know, the construction of the underground system. You know, depending on what kind of system, if it's a tunnel that's drilled from the outside, you can't see it. But if you're looking at structures that have been built up above the ground, you may see uh, details of this kind uh, uh, built by your adversary. But there's not much you can do about it. I mean, uh, if your adversary knows what they're doing, they could make uh, the uh, penetration of these munitions uh, very problematic. So I don't know uh, what the um, uh, what, what the uh, nature of the uh, protective uh, concrete or um, uh, stone granite that uh, is associated with these different sites are. But uh, one source I read, which again, I have no way of knowing if it's accurate, uh, says that uh, uh, Natanz has um, uh, 250 feet of, uh, of concrete. I, I don't know if that's quite a bit, but if that's the case, I can tell you they're not going to be able to destroy things in Natanz. It's a if, if they built a concrete structure that's that thick, uh, it's got to have inhomogeneous material in it, intentionally put in to cause the deflection of munitions. Uh, 